So it's great pleasure to. Okay, so recording now. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to to open this uh, semester uh, our um, early career research seminars with our own Christoph Zalder. Uh, I guess most people in the audience will know him, but I'm giving a brief introduction to those that are not at CASI. Uh, so Christoph uh, got his doctorate from the University of Vienna with um, for which he has done research work also at ESO, both in Chile and uh, in Garching. Then he continued briefly uh, as an IT consultant in, in industry, but then returned to uh, astronomy at KIAS. Um, and then he did one permutation in letters and came to Kasi and uh, he's doing great work uh, in DAISY among other things. And I guess we'll hear some of that now, uh, especially focusing on BAO, so go ahead. Thank you very much for this introduction. So today I will talk about the BAO peak and usually when we talk about BAO, we talk about spectroscopy, but you can also measure BAO peak using photometric data and some cross correlations and yeah, you will learn a little bit more about this later. And when doing this, we noticed something interesting, which will is this plot. I will show it to you later again with all the axis labels and explanations. So yeah, that's just a tiny teaser. Of course, this whole work I'm not doing alone. I have many collaborators mostly people who used to be at CASI or still are, like my advisor, Yong Sang Song, Min Chi O, Yi Zheng, Feng Shi, and Srivatran Rida, who were all postdocs or PhD students at CASI, but also outside of CASI within the DAISY collaboration, like Ji He Ding, Ron Pu Tzu, Ashley Ross, Jeffrey Newman, and Ji Hu Xiong Zhuang. And yes, so, all of those is in part influenced by my collaborators as well. So let's start with what is the BO peak. I found this nice video here. So you start with a dense over density, very high photon pressure that as soon as the universe cools, it expands outwards. This doesn't only happen at one location, but every over density. And as the universe expands, this distance scale freezes in at a certain level. And at this, this preferred distance scale, you will see that galaxies are more likely to form. So you have an over density in the galaxy distribution in the universe ingrained in this distance scale of the BO ring, the Byronic acoustic oscillations. And then you just take the different galaxies in there and measure the distances between them. So I think the video will get to it in like a second. Yeah, it zooms in. Yeah, so you just measure distance between two galaxies and then between other two galaxies and so on. And you do it for all the galaxies in the sample. And when you do this, you will notice that in this separation diagram, you will have, of course, a steady decline. Well, if you normalize the steady decline, if you go further away, actually increases, but you go with a random because there's clustering going on on small scales. But additionally, you will also have an over density at a certain distance that corresponds to the baryonic acoustic oscillation. Here's the BO peak. Yes, uh, I think I have to finish, let it finish before I can get to the next slide. Yeah, of course, this video was made by Castro, an Australian uh, organization, so it's not my own. So, uh, what we do is measure, we have to measure this BO in configuration space. So in basically how the positions of the galaxies are. There are lots of fast codes to do it. They have to do number calcs, like measuring the separations between the data and data, that's DD, the data and random. So you basically normalize everything using a random catalog that the random point spread out to give you a kind of a baseline what you would expect if there would be no structure at all in the universe compared to the data where you have structure here at the side, I put some simulation boxes, one with the, how data catalog looks like and how a random catalog looks like. And you measure all those counts between those. And then you have to use some correlation function to get, well, an estimate to get this correlation function, usually the Landy 
the lay estimate takes used with the definition below here. So after these very basics, we go one step further, we talk about the anisotropic correlation function. So what the video and everything before explained was the isotropic correlation function. So if you look in on the y-axis, you have the line of sight separation, which is essentially the redshift. And on the x-axis, you have the angular separation, so how far the galaxies are away on, a, on the sky or projected. In a box, it doesn't really matter, it's kind of the same. And if there's only the BO and nothing else, this is a very simplified picture, so it's not like it looks in real data, it's a simplification for illustration purposes. You, If you measure the isotropic one, you basically do this in uh, concentric circles from the center and do some binning, like here, have like this 10 megaparsec over H binning, and you get the correlation function. In this, it would be the isotropic one. In the anisotropic one, you have this additional binning in mu. So instead of just slicing it in circles, you also slice it in these kind of wedges additionally. And you have bins for all the overlaps. And this mu is defined as the ratio between pi and s, with s basically a distance, which is this pi, yeah. So this is just for illustration. So in reality, it's much messier. And yeah. Additionally, so I was talking about distances. So we have to measure distances. Ideally, you use redshift because you have a very good redshift distance relation. But so if everything would be perfect, every galaxy would be sitting still, there would be no biases or anything, you could use the redshift as a perfect distance indicator. But in practice, this is not the case. There are these so-called redshift space distortions or a thing of God effect to the peculiar motions, but also to the current infall into cluster shift, the Kaiser effect. So all kinds of messy stuff going there that goes into the uncertainties of redshift, of redshift as a distance. Additionally, you also have uncertainties of redshift measurements. So every measurement is has a small uncertainty. Redshift very good. Yeah, if you do spectroscopic redshift measurements, you have very small uncertainties. So it's usually at the same level as the redshift space distortions. But if you have photometric redshifts, those errors are huge and they will change the game quite a bit. So to illustrate how this photometric redshift wash out the clustering features, I show you here a warm gigaparsec simulation box. And here there is no ISD, that's the perfect data, the true positions of the galaxies. However, along the z-axis, we now add the effect of the redshift space distortions, so the peculiar motions of the galaxies within the clusters. You already see it's a little bit washed out. It's messier, but not that bad. However, there is on the side, I have this parameter sigma zero, which gives you kind of the magnitude of the photometric redshift uncertainties. And if we increase this, as you see in this video, it soon washes out the features more and more until, yeah, at this level we are around DESI now, and yeah, it gets worse if for even larger values. So I think here yeah, the video has to finish again. Yep. Yeah, and this value would correspond to the regist, uh, photometric register uncertainty in the DESI, in DESI. So you see them still some traces of the clusters, but they are mostly washed out. And to handle those uncertainties, it's hard, but it's doable, it's possible. So as I was talking about simulations, so those were just simulations for sure right now, uh, but we also have 100 cubic uh, dark box dark matter simulations, dark matter only, with uh, almost two gigaparsec side lengths and the mass resolution of about five times 10 to the power of 11 solar masses. We are populating the, those with HOD models corresponding to the DAISY LRG sample at a redshift of around 0 0.7. And we use those to as for basic tests of our methods to have a baseline to compare the observational data we will use later too. Additionally, we have cut sky marks matching DAISY footprints to get the covariance matrix for the observational data. 
those were done by my collaborators at DAISY. And yeah, as I was mentioning observa observational data a lot now. So I'm part of DAISY, so the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument Survey. It's an ongoing spectroscopic survey, has been running now for like eight, nine months in the main survey mode, but there was also a science verification before that. And the data from the first few months, essentially until the end of last summer, or the summer shutdown, is already internally available and processed. But additionally, we also have the photometric survey that was used for target selection. So the DAISY Legacy Imaging Survey DR9. And we use those as our observational data sets. So within DAISY, there are several target classes. So there is the Milky Way, survey, which is essentially stars and other objects around the Milky Way, so not really usable for cosmology, at least not the way we do it. Then there is the Bright Galaxy survey, which is on the nearby area, right around the redshift of 0 0.5. Then there are the LRGs, which are between 0 0.4 and uh, 1.1 in redshift, then the ELG and the QSO at higher redshifts. And in the end, we have to balance between the photometric redshift uncertainty, a relative photometric redshift uncertainty, which is kind of the best in the LRG range, and also the sample size, because the BGS has too few objects, even the lower part of the LRG has too few objects, so we have to go in the middle of the LRG range to basically have a nice balance between those two factors that are against us. So we need a large enough sample. So we need have to go far away because the volume increases. But we also need still reasonably good photometric redshifts. And the sweet spot there is for the energy, is that we find for the energy. So just to give you an overview of how DAISY will look like. And yeah, so they are the photometric surveys carried out by two different telescopes, actually three different telescopes. So in the south, it was using the same telescope as uh, the DES, Dark Energy Survey. That's why also in the photometric data you have in the south the footprint of the Dark Energy Survey as well. But it was extended north to about 31 degrees. And then beyond that, in north, you have the Mayal Z-Band Survey and the Beijing Aries Corner Size Survey that give you the reddish area in the north. And within this, you have the spectroscopic footprint. So not all of it will be observed by DESI spectroscopically, but most of it, you see a little bit of leeway on the edges. And if you go too far south, then you have problems with pointing the male telescope there because it's located in Arizona on the Northern Hemisphere and you can't really observe well at these low inclinations, uh, declinations, sorry. Yeah. And yeah, let's look at what has happened already at DESI. So in green, we have the spectroscopic footprint, so things that will eventually be observed once the survey is complete. In red, we have the photometric footprint, and we see the data collected by July last year is in purple. So it's mostly just one pass, so you really see nicely the DESI tiles. In the future, it will complete the whole area and then shift the past location. So you have various overlaps and there's now, originally Daisy was going for a depth first strategy, but then to the technical issues had to go with this first and now going for depth first again. So you have at the end of the first year, we have kind of a combination of both some very deep areas, but also large areas that are only covered by one pass of the Daisy survey. Why do we have to do multiple passes? It's because DAISY has this fiber arrangement, it can put 5,000 fibers at one tile, but you still won't reach all the targets, so you have to shift it a little bit to get the others you can't reach at the first pass. And in total, DAISY for the dark time, which is for the deeper targets, yeah, it will do seven passes. Yeah, so far, what we have some data right now, what can we do with it? So we can just use the photometric data collected by the DAISY Legacy Imaging Survey DR9, or we can already use the spectroscopic data collected and use the cost correlation between the photometric data to account for the incompleteness of the footprint. Yeah, or 
that's uh, two possibilities. And essentially, we are doing both. So we have the traditional photometric data and the cross correlations. For reasons that will become apparent later, I will start with the cross correlations. So um, we essentially the data we have right now is one pass uh, incomplete. And then we have the photometric area plus some little bit surroundings to fill in the gaps between the tiles. And we test this on simulations. And also we do the first test using the ob with observational data using the internal DCDA 0.2 data release. And yeah, for this, we have to basically do the fiber assignment as Daisy does it with the tiling strategy. So where the tile center are, how the gaps are, and basically draw this on a box for our tests. And this is how the fiber assignment would look like for one pass. So you see not the entire box is covered within one pass. That's why you have to shift it and in the second pass and do it again and so on. And you even see that within those green tiles, not all targets are hit. The, the green ones here, this is a zoom in of the box. You see not all red dots in within one green area are covered by the green dots. So there are still targets missed that will be captured in the next pass. And yeah, let's look how the correlation function, let's see how the correlation look, looks like. So if we have all the data in spectroscopic recovered, so after all the passes and everything is perfect, we would have a correlation function like this. We do this for 100 simulations. That's why we have the error bus. It's mostly offset up and down. So that causes it. So the photometric correlation function for the entire data looks like this. And then, we look at the spectroscopic photometric correlation function. So there is not too much gained. It's a little bit of improvement compared to a photometric correlation function, but not a big difference. So why do we even bother to continue with this? We can just either stay with the photometric data or wait until the spectroscopic data is collected. Well, this is for the complete data. However, the data is not complete and won't be complete for quite some time. So this is now the additional function you don't see appearing here is the spectroscopic correlation function using fiber assignment. So to see it, we have to zoom out. So it's a pretty big mess. It's totally offset and yeah. However, if we use this cost correlation between this fiber assigned spectroscopic data and the complete photometric data, we are down there again. So we can zoom in again and see that it's essentially at the same level, but with a larger scatter, since there's less data, than the correlation function, so at the cross correlation function before. So the cross correlations are insensitive to incompleteness of the spectroscopic data. Uh, we can check how this behaves for several passes. This is the spectroscopic correlation function for up to eight passes we had in our model. So it takes at least like, the fourth pass when we are already at 80% completeness in our simplified model to be pretty much where it's supposed to be. But yeah, it basically will take quite some time until it gets there. However, for, yeah, this is when we zoom in. However, when we look at the cross correlation function, it, the function itself stays pretty much the same. It just gets better the more data we have, the scatter reduces. So, of course, we tried this already with the internal DA 0.2 data, both in the north and the south footprint, because there are different photometric uh, selections between north and south, since there are some small systematic in the data that I accounted for. That's why we split it. And you also select the photometric data in a two degree radius around the spectroscopic tiles to fill out the gaps in between a bit. And this is the very preliminary data which we have. And we did some tests there in the sense of we were looking at the traditional method with PLP weights or not PLP weights. And if we add the weights or not add them for the spectroscopic data that's supposed to collect actually incompleteness, it's an alternative approach, it doesn't really affect it. So it's com a fully complementary approach to weight assignment. And yeah, here it's in a slide. So we can slightly see the BO peak. We still have to do covariance measurements and other things. This is very preliminary data. 
and work in progress. So, yes. Uh, so, what are the advantages of cross correlations? So, the cross correlations naturally cover the features, even if the spectroscopic data set is incomplete. So, we still get the BOP, even if we have a very sparse spectroscopic data set with all kinds of effects of tiling and fiber assignment that messes up the correlation function. It's a complementary method to the more standard methods like PFP weight. Combining both of them doesn't improve the data we found. That was a very interesting result. And it's a method that seems to be perfectly suited for early DESI data like the DS0.2 data and the year one data. So now the disadvantages. Only the lower mu bins can be used for cross correlations. I didn't show you the higher mu bins, but it gets increasingly more difficult. And the improvements over the photometric correlation function are, mean, are small. They are there, but they are not as big as we initially hoped for. And ultimately, when STACY is completed, the spectroscopic correlation function will totally outdo them and give much better results. And it's dominated by the, that's, yeah, as I said, the cross correlations are dominated by photometric correlations, uh, correlation function. So it suffers from the same systematic biases, which we will get to right now. So now we look at the photometric data only. So we use again the DAISY DR9 footprint. There was already a paper published by Srivasan uh, a few years ago on the southern part of DR8. So a previous release, there were different systematics, different target selection that have been now updated. And the original plan we had was to update it with DR9, include the northern footprint, and uh, make improvements to this and see what we get. Yeah, looked like an easy paper to basically repeat and improve previous work. Well, we found a few interesting things that make life much harder and we'll get to them. Uh, yes, so that's our target. So the LRGs in, uh, in the photomatic DR9 sample, we split it in north and south and we only limit ourselves to spectroscopic footprint because that was the limit of the uh, simulations we had. And also we set the ratchet range between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8, where we have the best compromise between numbers and ratchet uncertainties, because above 0 0.8, the photomatic ratchet get really, really bad. So first we do the BO peak measurements. Um, I show you the first two mu bins of the anisotropic correlation function. So we have some data points. Then as the next step, we use the covariance matrices to get the error bars. Then we see, oh, they are offset. When we want to use the easy marks that were we used, they are systematically offset. However, that's just because there's the galaxy bars between the old definition and the new one, since those were created for DR8 and we are working with DR9, it has shifted slightly, so we can just rearrange them and now this is done. Then we can fit a function for the BO peak and measure its location. And we will, if you look carefully, you will already see something. Surprisingly, in the north, also the data is much smaller, the BO peak is surprisingly very constrained. But also the locations seem to be tending towards slightly lower values than what you would expect from Planck at that redshift. So yeah, as I said, yeah, the value is surprisingly very constrained, but also as a smaller value. So it it's even with the error bars already in attention with Planck. And we've noticed that there are additional systematics that shift the photomatic BO peak as a function of mu. So we were doing some tests and then this paper came out by Chang et al that found a similar effect and already a possible solution for it. So that helped us a little bit along. So to illustrate what's going on there, I will show you some nice pictures. So this is the, a very simplified model. So we just have the BO as a feature, nothing else there. It's super simplified. We have again 
the sigma, which is the angular separation, and pi, that's the radial separation, so essentially in measured with redshifts. So this is the perfect position data. Now we add the mu bins, uh, just for illustration, and the s bins. So we get this kind of function for the PO peak. Very, very constrained about the value I set it to exactly 100 here for all the different mu bins. Then we add a spectroscopic uncertainty. So you have it a little bit washed out into the pi direction because, yeah, for measurement uncertainties and relative space distortions. Still, the BO peak still looks fine. Then we increase the photometric uncertainty a bit. Yeah, it gets messier. It seems to the higher mu bins will be lost eventually. So that's why we have to focus on the lower mu bins here in this area with the data. So each data point here, just for explanations, belongs to a certain mu bin, like this one, the blue one down here would be exactly the data collected in this bin here. Those are at the, that radius, yeah. Then we keep increasing the photometric uncertainty, and we will notice something that the, P, the peak locations for each mu bins float apart. They are not consistent anymore. Yeah. So this is the value if we have in DESI. Uh, yeah. And we see if we bin it not in this radial direction, but as this S orthogonal, as we call it. So essentially, it's the same as sigma. The, the washout effect of the photometric redshift uncertainty is controlled because everything gets washed out in the same direction here. And the BO peak is again consistent. The location is consistent. Yeah, we see while in the S, so in the radial direction, it's not. When we just use this, it's consistent. So we can show this for the different, when we reduce it again, we see that, yeah, it's consistent up to a certain value in a orthogonal. But then when we get to spectroscopic quality, it will become inconsistent since we have, yeah, it's not as washed out anymore. So there's kind of a saturation level that's reached, reached for the DESI uncertainty. And yeah, here we have it nice and consistent. But if you look more closely, we you will notice a different problem. So let's zoom into this plot. The peak location is not where it was originally. So it's not just that it's, we have to measure it in a slightly different way, but it's offset. So it's not at the 100, 100 we set it to, but at the lower value. And while on one hand, we found the same thing as they found in the paper, Chang et al, that yeah, there is this shift with the different mu bins of the peak location, uh, unless you use S orthogonal. And it depends on the redshift uncertainty and you reach kind of a saturation level uh, between like 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 in sigma zero, or well, they did sigma set here on this plot. Uh, yeah, that's just multiplied with the redshift. And Yes, so this is the old news. This was found. However, in the in their paper, they didn't mention this. So now this is not the simplified model. This is the full simulation data we have of 100 simulations. And we see that for different mu bins in s yeah, the location of the bio peak is very consistent. However, since we have a simulation, we know where it's supposed to be. We can do it measured in spectroscopic data. We know it from the theory. It's supposed to be here but the peak appears to be here in the photometric data. So there is a systematic offset of it. And that's the new news, or fresh news as I call them. Yeah, because new news sounds stupid. Uh, they, the paper was great, but they missed out on this detail that the location of the photometric BO peak is systematically offset from the spectroscopic BO peak. So we did some measurements using a peak finder of course, since it's one higher realization with some cosmic grants, there's a little bit of a scatter here. But you can see that at the dotted line here, that corresponds to the true peak location. And we find the peak when we measure them for different sigma zeros around sigma 0, 0 0.2, 0 
that desaturate around this value. So there's some systematic offset. And that messes up everything. So it's a great finding, but first we have to now quantify this offset, which means also that we have to reevaluate all the papers like the one from Silversan in 2020. And it also affects the cross correlation. So that's why I did the cross correlations first, because yeah, you didn't see it there as much, but it also affects it. It's similar, but not exactly the same. And we have to study what's the cosmological dependence of the offset. What can we still learn from the photomatic peak? It will limit our, our constraints on it quite a bit. And this is where we are working right now. So at the moment, we are doing some testing for the cosmological offset of the BO peak, comparing the basically true data with different cosmologies and simula in simulation. But it's a bit of a challenge because of the variance, cosmic variance. So we need more simulations at the moment. We just have one in all the cosmologies, but we might need more in the future. Also, they have all the same seed, but still, there are some issues with cosmic variance and pop HOD populations, actually. We are currently working on. And in the next steps, so we want to quantify the shift of the photomatic BO peak. Then, of course, we do the photomatic. DNI measurements in terms of uh, the under suppressed correlation function, but with S orthogonal instead of the regular S. And we want to finally publish this much delayed paper on it. So first, yeah, this paper seems to be kind of cursed. We thought it would be easy. Then we found, yeah, that in the north, the position is a little bit strange. Then we looked into more details and we found lots of issues hidden behind it that were overlooked in the first estimate in the first paper on it. Yeah, also we have to adjust our method for the cross correlations and um, future measurements for our DAC, DAC 0.2 and in the future also for the year one data of DAC. So now we are essentially at the end of the talk. So what do you want to take home from this? So we know that the photomatic BO peak is shifted for different mu bins as a function of S. However, the location of the photomatic BO peak is stable between the different mu bins if you measure it as a function of S orthogonal. So this is some news from essentially last year, but important. However, the really important thing now, which might mess up a lot of things, is that the location of the photomatic BO peak is systematically different from the spectroscopic, the true location. And this has to be considered in all future BOPIC studies, is including the cross correlations one, and it will be a challenge. And we are currently working on properly quantifying it and giving you a, a way to do it and get some scientific data still from the photomatic BOPIC data. And yeah, any questions? Thanks for this great talk. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please use the, uh, in, in reactions, you can raise the hand or uh, just unmute. Uh, yeah, if no one wants to go first, uh, I won. Please go ahead. Um, hi, Christoph. Thank for hi. very nice talk, very clear talk. Um, okay. I have one question. I mean, there's still, I have a little problem with the philosophy of this work, even though I think it is very interesting. I'm just thinking that maybe these kind of works can be used in a different context. First of all, even imagine that you can correct that offset and uh, those biases are corrected and you are doing this uh, cross correlation, which is very interesting if you have this fiber assignment issues, but, uh, but with the quality which you can get, can you compete with the current spectroscopic observation from let's say STSS? That's a good question. I think uh, we can't really. They will it will be so. Oh yeah, I should have put. I forgot to put in one plot from uh, Silverson's paper where we compare to others. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I kind of forgot to add this plot to the talk. Um, it's not. We have large error bars, so it's not at the same quality. But with the photometric data, we can access areas of the skies where there is no spectroscopic survey yet. 
So we are always ahead a bit. That would be an advantage. Also, there are some upcoming photometric surveys like JPES that will have a photometric uncertainty that's comparable to the redshift to spectroscopic redshift uncertainty. Not almost so spectroscopic redshift uncertainty is around 0 0.001 and it's 0 0.003. So we would be still in the part where this offset wouldn't affect it. So there might be something in this area. But yeah, spectroscopic data is always better than photometric data. But the thing is with Stasio and others, it takes longer to get. Okay. Okay, I have two more related questions. One is that if we look at this problem from another angle, that we know where is the BAO peak, we know what is the cosmology, we know what is the right things. Is it possible to use this information rather than getting the BAO peak from the photometric data? Trying to improve the photometric redshift estimation. That's definitely an interesting approach. So I'm, I'm, I've not done photometric redshift calibrations myself. I was collecting data for photometric redshift calibrations, <laughs> but actually the work on it is nowadays mostly done by machine learning. So you could work it the other way around for sure. That's possible, but I have not considered or tried this yet. Okay. And if you got some idea, let me know, because I think it, it might be interesting if this information can flow from another direction and uh, help the algorithms to, to estimate the redshifts, photometric redshifts. And that can be used, you know, the whole analysis like this can be used as a kind of a calibration to improve the algorithms to estimate the photometric redshift. My last question is that, um, have anyone considered to test the isotropy uh, cosmic isotropy using uh, photometric redshift in the south and north in the data? We wanted to compare the south and north, but we haven't really, they, I, I'm not aware of any work. I know most fo focus on only one part of the survey, so I'm, I've noticed that there's some difference between the north and south in the data, but the error bars are large, so in the photometric one. So but no one no one used the photometric data from the legacy survey to test isotropy. No, as far as okay. I know, not. Well, this, this is something interesting. Maybe we can discuss later, you know. I mean, because uh, that is a still isotropy considering the spherical asymmetry we see in the CMB map, is uh, it's still one of the questions and uh, or at least interesting questions. So um, it might be nice things to just a simple test to see yeah. if this data can be used to test idolatry. Okay, thank you. So I have this plot here and that can add something what I tried is you see that in the southern footprint, the photometric footprint, it's a very washed out BO peak. Mm -hmm. So I tried to split it into a north and south galactic cap because the daisy footprint of the south is split by the Milky Way. And when I do this, that's not here yet in the plots. I did one test plot was that actually the washout effect is because I get two diff different locations there. So it's like, nice, interesting, yeah. Yeah, but it's always the uncertainties are so large with photometric data that you're never sure if it's just sampling or some selection mm. thing, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a follow-up question about that. So you were showing the NOZ uh, in the north and the south, and they are slightly different. Uh, yeah. If you want to test uh, isotropy, uh, so you, to to if if you want to um, get the NOZ, you usually assume isotropy. Uh, so are you kind of biting your own tail if you wanted to use that as a test of an isotropy, or? The problem is between the two footprints, it's two different telescopes, actually three different telescopes. So you have all those survey biases that also go into a photometric redshift calibration since this overset is with photometric redshift right now. They are doing it with spectroscopic as the data is collected by DAISY. So I'm wondering if the, it's, I think too hard, the differences are not that big uh, with the, adjusted target selection, I think it's very hard to quantify anything by just comparing those two and over that data. There are too many uncertainties going into those two. Okay. Well, you already had that slide. I have another question about 
So it, when you do the, the cross correlations in the south, you have a lot more area uh, in the photometric survey than in the spectroscopic one. Uh, do you do uh, do you do you cut down your photometric area to match that of the spectroscopic survey, or do you um, use both? Or do you use the full photometric survey? Yeah. So I cut. So as you see in this plot here, the green is the spectroscopic data used. And the red is the photometric data used. So we cut it out around the spectroscopic tiles. So we usually a daisy tile has a radius of 1.4 degree. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I usually have this in a file and it's just a variable. Um, and here we use two degrees. So we have a little bit around to basically get the gaps between the tiles as well. But we are not using the entire one. You see all the pink area, the just pink area we are not using. We're just using the reddish area for the cross correlations. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, Motonari. Oh, hello, Christoph. Uh, I'm Hi, interested. Martin. Yeah, I'm interested in the reason of the offset. So, do you have any idea on that? Uh, yes, it's essentially in those very illustrative oh, this one. diagrams. So when we increase the un redshift uncertainty, you see data, look at maybe at the, the third bin here, the third mu bin in the center, those data get scattered up and down. And since it's already a little bit at a lower distance, it will get scattered to lower values here. I see, but... Uh... I still see the peak is, uh, it's, uh, I see, it's like... Uh, yeah, you mm. see the ring is here at 100 initially, then it moves lower, lower, uh, so, okay. that's when you look at, yeah. Because you get the data from uh, the ring if, scattered down uh, and that basically offsets the entire distribution. I see, so essentially the mm, smaller information on smaller sigma is... Mm, yeah, less uh, effective. Yeah. Uh, if you increase it, and then it kind of saturates when everything is there. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other raised hands, so I, I go again myself. Um, do you have any analytic insight on how you could predict this offset, or do you have to run simulations every time you want to? Uh, at the happen. moment, we have two models. So we have the simulations that we can do easily. In the modeling, we have something essentially we're working in the sigma pi diagram. And because this is not a simulation, this is essentially those plots were done using my model of the offset. But they still doesn't fully match yet. So we are working on basically drawing this in the DR, in the DD data, in the DR data. We just do this photometric scattering there. So we wash it out. But one issue is, yeah, I think we are, currently I think we are underestimating by roughly a factor of two and I have an idea where it comes from, but I still have to test it. So we, the main difficulty is how to create essentially a Sigma Pi diagram from the theory well. At the, the current model we are using to predict the BO peak or the theoretical model works in Fourier space and not in uh, configuration space. So there is one step missing to do this properly. So we, can, we, we can't really create a sigma pi diagram for the spectroscopic data and then modify it properly. There is, yeah, we, we are struggling a little bit on the theoretical side. So we are working on it. We have a few ideas. It's not fully there yet. Let's put it this way. Okay. Hopefully that will work out soon. Um, we still have a lot more time for questions. Or yeah, I think it was talking too fast. Mm -hmm. David? Yeah, I, I guess I wanted to follow on a little bit with that. Is, there, is it possible to change? I mean, this, uh, this correlation function, you're presumably just using Landy's delay estimator, right? Yes. So is it possible, would it be possible to change the estimator in such a way that you recover the correct 
could you apply some extra weights or inverse weights such that things with a smaller galaxies with a smaller photo z error are weighted higher and galaxies with a larger photo z error current contribute less to the overall correlation function to correct for this i think this won't help much because the photo c error for daisy where we are using the, it's already so large even other if there are a few galaxies that have individually a lower error i think it won't contribute that much hmm. yeah it will be still yeah maybe it has half the error but yeah we are still in a way that offset yeah if we have lucky galaxies yeah yeah, it's really those those large mu bins which yeah. are kind of which are kind of be significant. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wants to ask a question? Um doesn't look like it. Um, so maybe we can close here. So thanks, Christoph, for this great talk. Uh, it's very insightful. I think there has been quite a lot of uh, progress since last time you gave a talk about this. In, yes. In so it was good to see that.